So I have the privilege this afternoon of welcoming the stream team that we have to talk about the integration of PBIS and SEL for the adults and students in this time of need. So with me today are Susan Barrett from the National PBIS TA Center and Tammy Bolin, my coworker here at OSPI, who is the program supervisor for social emotional learning. And the two of them are going to take this session. If you have questions throughout the, the session that you would like answered, go ahead and put those in the Q&A um, at the bottom. And they'll stop periodically to uh, address some of your questions as you go. But knowing um, we have an hour and this is there's so much depth to what they have, I am going to stop talking and turn it over to the two of them. So I will stop sharing my screen. And you can take the screen, Susan, and it is all yours. Great. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm really great to be with you this afternoon. Thanks for joining us virtually. Uh, um, hopefully you were able to see Dr. Sugai this morning um, and other breakout sessions. Uh, this is really going to build on what um, was described and discussed this morning. So we're really excited that you were able to join us. Uh, again, my name is Susan Barrett. I um, am with the Center on PBIS and I am one of the technical assistance directors there. And I'm also a director at the Center for Social Behavior Supports at Old Dominion University out of Virginia. I am based in California and help support uh, the School Climate Transformation Grant with Washington and really privileged to, um, to partner with OSPI and a big shout out to, to Justin and your conference team on putting together such a fabulous event um, in such a short amount of time. Um, I am joined by um, Tammy, and I'll let Tammy introduce herself. Hi, I'm Tammy Bolin, and I am, as Justin mentioned, at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction in Washington. I am fairly new to the position, been there about four or five months, and uh, coming from Nevada in the School Improvement uh, Office, and just very excited to be involved in the social emotional learning in Washington. And thank you, Susan, for letting me be a part of this presentation. Well, thank you for joining. Uh, so um, given that these are two big constructs to try to pull off within an hour, uh, Tim and I thought we would focus on the here and now and focus on what we can be doing to set up and focus on establishing the social emotional competencies and connections with students right now. Um, I think throughout um, this process, I think we've all learned how critical and key relationships are and, um, and understanding our emotions through this space and landscape. And so we really wanna um, kind of call our attention to some things um, first and foremost in, in, in this kind of redesign. Um, I, we want to build on this MTSS notion that, and, and kind of going back to what um, Dr. Sugai kind of set the stage for us this morning, MTSS is really helping us provide a framework to develop systems of supports, um, not only for our students and their families, but also our staff. And so as we think about blending and integrating our PBIS and SEL efforts into a, a, a single system of delivery and a single MTSS system, I want us to really be thinking um, of some key takeaways for this session in particular. And I wanted to kind of drill down and have a laser focus on four specific outcomes for the here and now. One is that for today, SEL and PBIS integration means that we all have a clear process for checking in with all of our students, their families, and all of our staff. Number two, that we have a system where we can continuously identify what our community needs are. They're changing so rapidly in this time and space that we find ourselves in. And it's really important that there is a system um, that falls back on our core features of MTSS, but we have a system where we are uncovering the immediate needs of our students, families, um, and staff. Number three, that this time that we have 
um, in this virtual um, learning space is a time where we can build and strengthen relationships with each other as colleagues, but also that we've got this opportunity where we can um, develop and even strengthen um, our relationships with our students and really using this time right now to do that. And then finally four, and George really hit this hard this morning with respect to using a team approach, a team-based approach for really developing a plan for redesigning and reimagining what this will be moving forward, what our education landscape will be moving forward. And this is such a great opportunity to um, pull in the key and core components of MTSS to really build a resilient community. So we're gonna go into what it might look like planning over the next 36 months, knowing that we might have a phased in and phased out kind of dynamic, um, things are fluid, um, but if we can and use this time to really develop out a team-based plan, um, we will be um, in pretty good shape to respond to the needs um, that are coming our way. We also wanted to highlight some resources. Um, so Tammy's gonna share with us some online training modules that you might wanna pursue as we um, build some training opportunities for our staff. And then finally, focusing in on some of our SEL learning activities that families can, um, that you can share with your families and educators that you can kind of take today and use. Okay. Um, so again, this kind of, um, wanted to start by calling out some key observations I think we're all having at this moment in time. Um, number one, um, and we've always known this, but it's become um, really uh, critically obvious right now, and I think a lot of the public is really seeing this, that our schools are really the primary care providers. That we, you know, first and foremost, of course, we are educators, but we are also primary care health, mental health, and basic care providers. And that can be seen in how um, school systems are now providing um, basic needs like food. Um, we are also places where um, our children um, feel safe, that we provide shelter for them. There's spaces where our children and our families and our staff receive mental health and wellness supports and education. Um, it's never been so, um, so apparent, I think, in, um, in recognizing that uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is really critical in this space and time. And um, I worry as we, as we come back online that we're gonna be, um, we're gonna want this urgency to catch up with instructional minutes, mm -hmm. that we're gonna lose the focus on, um, on how key these, um, these basic needs are in order for us to, to play catch up. So one takeaway message for today is that we've really got to stay consistent with um, figuring out how to make sure that our kids feel safe, they feel they've got their basic needs met, they feel a sense of connection and belonging and love before we move to the instructional um, piece from an academic lens. So key big message is we've got a Maslow both at our individual and organizational level before we can bloom. Mm -hmm. Observation number two, it is absolutely extraordinary um, what we've seen over the past six weeks. There are caring, compassionate, extraordinary humans everywhere doing amazing and extraordinary things. And this crisis has really led to uh, an amazing amount of innovation and when we think about what we've been able to craft um, in the last six weeks, imagine what we will be able to do when we come back together and redesign our learning environments that place a lot more focus on um, social, emotional, behavioral competencies and mental health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Observation number three, we have a range of coping strategies and responses and um, that has led a lot of us to be in hyper mode. And um, I'll own this. I'm part of a center that's generated a ton of resources. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of resources to begin with, um, but there have been um, a tsunami of resources that have come your way. And I think right now it's time to really listen to what the specific needs are in the community. And it's time to organize and sort and match the specific resource to what you need out in the field. 
So I realize we don't have a chat box today, so I'm re really um, hoping that you'll use the question and answer section to, um, to raise up your, uh, your specific needs in your community as we go through some of the slides today. I also really think that, that this last six weeks has, in, in terms of tsunami resources has really exposed that we generally do this to our schools on a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. We put a lot of things on your plate and this notion of feeling overloaded, feeling overwhelmed um, is there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I really want us, again, going back to what George Sugai said this morning, we need a team to be able to drill down to the essential things that we need. What are the smallest things that will have the biggest impact? And really pick one or two things that are critically important and that meet the needs of our community. So less is more in this regard. And I liked the fact that when he said, uh, choose interventions that can be adaptable and um, that, that they can, um, all, you can alter them instead of just choosing an entirely new intervention if that doesn't work. So right, right. Be smart about how you're even choosing those. Exactly, exactly. We need to be good consumers of what's out there and be um, really careful and cautious about not continuing to overwhelm um, ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Observation number four, um, you know, COVID-19 is really impacting um, our black, brown, and migrant communities and our other vulnerable populations at a much higher rate than others. And this really has to do more in how that's rooted in the social inequalities that have taken place in this country for too many generations. Um, we also are recognizing um, how fragile our, our larger safety net is and how many more of our families and students are caught in um, this moment in time that they never thought they'd be in. And so being able to respond to the increased need is gonna be really important as we move into coming back physically into the buildings. Um, I also wanna call our attention to um, not only have our communities, some of our communities impacted by COVID, we've got a, a lot of our communities around the country and, and specifically in our area that are impacted by other aspects. Um, and uh, just want to call it that that complicates matters um, a little bit. Um, and that, you know, as, as we come back online in the fall, I'm really worried about kind of this notion of um, preparing for um, environmental impacts. And so we just want to kind of call that out um, too. Observation number five, uh, the wave of mental health needs were, are, and will be staggering. Um, caution though, not everybody's really gonna be negatively impacted. We've got experts that are gonna assist us um, in knowing kind of the differences between um, trauma and what, what is a stressor. Um, but we need to really focus on kind of the protective factors that, that Dr. Sagai was describing um, this morning, which Tammy goes into to what you were kind of pointing out that with all of the, the needs, we have to resist the temptation to add. We have to focus on fortifying or strengthening our tier one supports so that we're meeting the needs of most. And we'll talk a little bit about what that might look like and sound like for your school and school system. And then finally, when we think about a team approach, we really need to elevate our mental health leaders in this space right now. They need to be leading the charge. If we're going to really um, rely on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then our mental health leaders need to be focused on what our community needs if we're going to, if we're going to expect our kids and our staff to perform um, in the academic realm. So how do we have our grief counselors be in positions where they're leading? How do we position our drug prevention specialists to be part of that team. Um, so we need to make sure our, our mental health leaders are leading. And Observation number six, this is an awesome opportunity. This, we, we can't, um, there's a lot of silver linings to what's going on right now. It gives us this opportunity to pause and reset. It gives us this opportunity to focus on prevention science and building and prioritizing these amazing pro-social communities. Um, 
George Sugai talked um, this morning about Tony Biglin's work and, um, you know, we know exactly what to do. That's the amazing thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's about um, the political uh, willingness to have an equal priority for social emotional health. And I'm really hopeful that this moment in time is going to accelerate the interest of an integrated comprehensive approach and really bringing mental health um, forward and, um, and and right now I think is a great time for us as mental health leaders in this space to to sort of prepare for that to to occur. Now more than ever, we know that mental health really needs to be everyone's job, but not everybody's comfortable with that. So how do we um, position our professional development and our skill building strategies to make sure people are confident and confident in um, in their role as as we build social emotional platforms into the classroom setting. Um, so the mental health leaders in this space are really going to have the job of building our capacity so that we can all respond to this emerging need. The systems and structures are going to be extremely um, important. The policy that shapes this changing world, the funding opportunities, the blend, the need for blended funding um, is going to is going to need to be addressed. We also recognize now more than ever that we need a healthy workforce and we need to focus on making sure that our staff are well and that the organizational system is set up um, with a policy on wellness and that's not just put on the onus of the individual to be well. Um, now more than ever, we can't talk about academic rigor without talking about how we develop relationships how we embed the teaching of social emotional and behavior competencies right into the academic arena and how we really move forward establishing a culture of wellness. Um, I want to call out too that teaching social emotional behavior competencies and SEL curriculum is instructional time and we shouldn't feel stressed when we um, when we're teaching that as as though it's taking away from academic instructional time. It is academic instructional time. So I just really want to call that out. Again, going along with this opportunity, we have um, this, uh, this space where we, as, as a collective, schools, our community partners, our families, can really invest in a resilient, a resilient response, really, that, that's going to change how we approach teaching and learning forever. Um, this investment and priority for social-emotional growth, I think the call to action is there, right? This, this is... Um, this, the time is now for this to happen, right? We can't let this crisis go to, go to waste. So the questions we have for you are um, really, I, you know, what systems and structures do you already have that are needed to, to move this needle more forward? What are the evidence-based curriculum that you're going to use? Do you already have an SEO curriculum? Um, if not, how will you choose one that's the right fit? Um, and then when we put PDIS core features and MTSS core features, we pair that alongside SEL. And when we do that with fidelity, the outcome that we're all striving for is really that we're going to have students and staff increase their use of uh, social emotional skills. So we want to focus on fidelity. We want to focus on the social emotional growth and we want it to work side by side in, in the academic space. The question to you right now are what are the systems and structures you need um, moving forward that will that will allow that to happen? So we're asking you to to write that down yeah. to, to answer that question in the Q and A. Right. Section. Right. Yeah. Thanks for that prompt. So observation number six, um, as we think about um, kind of what's needed, you know, this wave of, of supports that, that our kids are going to need, we really need a team-based approach where we can plan for the next 36 months, right? We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I think that it's fair to say we should expect kind of a rolling phased in approach and expect maybe to go back and shelter in place at any given time. And that might be um, community by community, that might be that not that might not occur statewide, but it will be really important for us to the extent possible for us to really gear up for the next 36 months. And when we think about continuity of education, we cannot miss the continuity of care that will need to be established and the support for all, including our staff. 
the team will be the backbone to make this happen with the processes and procedures that um, that will need to be called out and, I, and MTSS really lays the foundation for that to happen. We need to develop and share creative ways to uncover needs, right? That check-in protocol right now, what does that look like and sound like when we're in, that, in this virtual space? And what will our response be for all, for some, and few? So that tiered logic, that public health piece is gonna be um, really important as we uncover the needs of, of our kids and in our families. And then this notion that um, it will be really important for us to be able to aggregate and analyze the data in real time. So our teams will play a very critical role and we can use the Zoom platform and use the similar procedures we were using when we were in brick and mortar to really aggregate and analyze the data in real time. So that through line of before, during, and after is going to be really, really critical. So let's talk about kind of those outcomes that we wanted you to walk away with today in terms of thinking about what we can do now. The question I have is for you all is, do you have a continuous check-in protocol right now that you're using with all of your students and staff, right? To what extent are you monitoring email messages that might be coming in? Um, to what extent are all staff maybe assigned to different groups of students where we can all kind of take um, students that might be in our classroom or might not be in our classroom, but can we all be assigned a group of students where we check in on a regular basis? Um, to what extent are our teams that were in place before um, COVID, um, are, are we really using them to check in with each other, right? Our smaller professional learning communities. Um, and there are many ways that you all have innovated um, these check-in protocols, right? Some of you are checking in with your students by phone. Some of you are checking in and going on um, bus routes. And when there's food being delivered, you're going in and checking in and getting your eyes and ears on the kids in, the, in their communities. Or when our families are coming in to pick up their food items, you're there looking inside the cars and checking in on your students. So we, we have these innovative strategies where we um, are, are trying to uncover what the needs are and to make sure our kids are doing okay. I've also heard um, that folks are deli hand delivering instructional packets as a way to check in with our students and also putting in yard signs as a way to say, hey, we're here, here's a phone number, you can reach out if you need anything at all during this time. So the important message here is that consistency about how we are checking in with all of our students and all of our staff. We need communication protocols in order to do that. And we have some samples that we're happy to share with you. Um, but we also need our staff to know when red flags emerge in those conversations or phone calls or when we're reading over emails. And we need a protocol and process to connect our students who we might be worried or concerned about we need to be able to connect them quickly to specialized supports. Um, and so you see a couple of examples right there. Um, we can also use this time as we were kind of describing before as an outcome is to connect and strengthen um, relationships with um, both adults and students. So as you're maybe putting in um, the question box, we wanna hear from you what your specific needs are with respect to um, tools or resources on developing and strengthening relationships, because some of us might not be comfortable with that face-to-face, um, -face, much less doing it in a virtual space. Um, we want to hear from you as we kind of sort through um, all of the resources, what the needs are for your adults um, and for your students, and, and tell us what some of the barriers are as you continue to innovate that we can um, kind of examine to see if we can remove some of those barriers for you. So happy for you to um, type in the, the question box. Um, we can um, sift through those and, um, and provide some, some responses down the road. And, and I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing some great questions and then highlighting some, some needs. So we will, um, 
we Sarah will definitely look into this and and Jamie thank you all for responding we will definitely be replying to these these great and these great. needs absolutely the other thing that we wanted to call out, if you already are using an SEL curriculum, um, there might be lessons now that might be really helpful. And um, it's going to be important that we don't overwhelm and give um, different strategies and skills each day, but rather looking at the specific needs of who we're serving. We might want to pull out a lesson on a coping strategy or a calming strategy and just do one skill at a time. We might want to take time during our team meetings to practice those calming strategies together in a virtual platform before we share that out during an academic lesson. So really kind of pulling in really small things that we can do that will have a big impact. Um, it will be important that we describe what it looks like in context. So a calming strategy that we might employ in the home might be really different than the calming strategy that might work at in when we go back to school. So being able to describe what it looks like and sound like in each of those locations and contexts. And Tammy's going to walk us through some of the ways that um, the lessons in the SEL curriculum that OSPI has um, will help you do that as you um, are uh, kind of exploring those lessons. Mm -hmm. um, we also want um, kind of professional development that focuses on how the brain responds in a stressful environment and how that impacts learning, both for adults and students. Um, stressful environments, stressful people <laughs> don't learn um, very well. And so we wanna make sure that we're actually looking at some of the brain science that uncovers um, that notion. Um, and that might be really helpful now and moving forward. So really identifying what training we provide for our staff now that gets them ready to be in the space when we come back online. And, and I, again, I'll be talking a little more about the trauma-informed professional development and modules that we have that, that can help in this area. Right. right. So, again, just lifting up and, and using this time really um, right now to invest in connecting and strengthening our relationships, identifying the needs, sharing our innovative efforts with one another, identifying and prioritizing those skills, and it's one skill at a time, right? And really understanding that so we can train our teams now in all of these efforts um, moving forward now that's for all of our students let's now talk about what some of our students might need and when we're thinking about um, moving up um, the intensity of supports, I want you to think about increasing the dose and frequency so while we might be checking in with all of our students um, there will be subgroups and specific students that will require more frequent check-ins. Same holds true for staff. There might be staff right now who feel, um, who might be impacted personally by COVID, who might not be co as comfortable navigating the virtual landscape, who might need a little bit more support, right? We need to be able in our system teams, our MTSS teams, to be able to assign those groups of students to specialized staff. So for instance, there might be a group of students who have specific medical issues that have to be addressed. Well, our nurse should be that primary person that's doing those check-ins with those, that group of students. Our special educator teams checking in with students with disabilities. Our um, ELL teams checking on those students um, who are English language learners, right? So you see how we might increase the dose and we might do the assignments a little bit differently. But I also want us to think about um, the new group of students who may be um, personally impacted by COVID, whether their family's family member is sick, or maybe one of their family members is on the front line and they have extra stress put on them. There might be students who are now um, food insecure as a result of maybe a layoff in their family. Um, there are also students um, who are grieving the non-event. You know, I, I, I'm also worried about the students who are transitioning from elementary to middle, middle to high, and our graduating seniors who might are, um, be really grieving and mourning the fact that they didn't have the prom or they didn't have those celebrations and they weren't able to say goodbye and thank you to, to staff. So really, again, how do we increase and know these new groups of students that are on the rise and that, that are personally impacted? Um, 
And some of our staff, again, are going to need increased supports and training, and they might need um, more training on connecting with students in the virtual platform. So that's yes, what we really want to recognize, too, with this, um, with this kind of component, is that we need to document our efforts. You know, we need to be able to progress monitor. We need to be able to adjust the frequency, the duration, and the dosage based on the data that we're getting in. So having some sort of data system that allows us to sort different students by, by need and by different type of need is going to be really important. So again, on for returning to school, again, we need that system of support that um, that's the through line between what, we're, what we did before, what we're doing now, and what we do when we come back. So I want you to think about the context will change, but the system of support and the core features within that system of support should remain the same. So I want you to think about identifying what all of your students are needing, right? We've been talking about that. Where your team right now and moving forward are going to serve as surveillance teams. They're going to be actively seeking and uncovering the needs. I want you to think about what information you're going to use to inform our approach to strengthening our tier one, right? Maybe understanding the number of staff and students impacted by the virus, the number of students and staff impacted economically, or the number of students and staff impacted by a loss of a family member. We also want to plan um, when we move back in to school that that data might be replaced by our natural data sources that we collect when we're in brick and mortar, right? Those formalized screening data, the attendance information, nursing logs, instructional time. Um, but we need to keep with our routine of uh, being in that surveillance mindset. We know that this work has to start with a multidisciplinary tier one team, right? that team that's really focused on coordinating efforts for all, for all students and all staff. We wanna make sure that we don't have multiple teams duplicating efforts, but we have a single set of teams that's representing our school and our community partners. So we need to be thinking about how we bring our families into this and our community partners, because schools aren't gonna be able to do this alone. It's gotta be really on the shoulders of a larger community effort. I want you to think about the accurate picture of your students' needs. And these might be data points that you recognize from um, being in school prior and when we come back online. But it's important that we look in data at the aggregate level before we start to um, put people, um, before we add one more thing or before we think about um, increasing tiers of supports. The tier one team is also going to make sure that our staff feel connected and that they feel like they've got the skills that they can manage their workload, that they can manage their changing role as the mental health ambassador, and that they have the skills and we're providing the right coaching supports and we're making it manageable. So that team not only focuses on student support, but also staff support. So I'll just end here before I, I turn it over to, to Tammy. Um, I want you to think about the essential components as we come back online. Um, there are a lot of these things as you look through this list that you were probably doing prior, right? If you were focused on PDIS efforts and doing that really well, you were focused on making sure that everybody um, had clearly defined expectations, there were procedures and routines, they were consistent across locations. We now may want to elevate that and strengthen that by um, adding uh, elements around physical distancing and hand washing, for instance. Um, we might want to do a, a more rigorous uh, protocol for embedding um, social emotional competence and behavioral competencies into our teaching matrix. And we've got a resource that we have put forward around how to do that. Um, and we'll make sure that we, we connect you to that resource on our PBIS.org site. But I, I also think we need to make sure that we've got some daily routines that we're embedding that allow classrooms to build a sense of community that fosters relationships and, and continues to, to have everybody feel connected. Whether that be a morning circle that we do within the classroom, 
Um, but what are the opportunities and, and within our schedule do we have those common routines where we're able to come together and as a collective within, the, within a classroom space really build that sense of community out. So that's really about strengthening our tier one application, right? We also need to, um, to really operationalize and define ways that our students are asking for help. And we see even before this, we had um, a lot of our schools put suicide hotlines on our teaching matrix um, and, and warm lines on our teaching matrix, but we really want to script the moves for both our students and our staff to, to, to um, provide them um, the right ways to ask for help when they feel like they're in trouble. George talked about this um, earlier this morning about the importance of positive readings at the door um, and that amazing research that um, that uh, that was completed uh, by Clay Cook. And we really want um, the MTSS systems to uh, increase the number of positive readings. So that means that we're going to need to have these systems that nudge your staff a little bit more correctly. Um, and that we're making sure that we are tracking the positive social interaction throughout the day. We can use our active supervision strategy and enhance that strategy. We might have coaches or team members collect frequency data on how our staff are moving, scanning, and interacting with our students and almost make it a game element to it where we're increasing um, the frequency count by which our adults are greeting our kids, having those positive social interactions, and maybe we even um, look at our adult to adult social interactions and our student to student social interactions. So we can do that in a really easy kind of metric, but really kind of hold us a, more accountable for making um, a deliberate um, uh, kind of impact as we maybe strengthen our active supervision protocol. Um, we really want to elevate um, this notion of having spaces and routines for teachers. Do we have a space in our school set aside where there is a, um, an opportunity to pause, to regroup, to reset, um, to practice a neutralizing routine before we kind of step into a chaotic or environment? Um, are there times where we might need to do huddles either in the beginning or end of the day as a staff um, to talk about things that we can do differently as a, collect as a collective? Right, so really, again, thinking about um, expanding what we were already doing in tier one and elevating um, to make sure that we're taking care of each other in this kind of resilient mindset. Finally, um, the last two uh, around teacher connectedness and making sure that our teams are serving as those check-ins when we come back online, and making sure that we have embedded wellness activities for, for our staff. And then finally, um, to what extent do we continuously have this growth mindset culture where staff get ongoing training and coaching and performance feedback that's feasible, that matches the need, um, and that we've got a team that's looking at the data to make sure that we're applying that new knowledge in the space of our classrooms and in the space of our, our schools. So hopefully you got um, some um, ideas with respect to building a team-based approach for returning to school, um, but that we should be really using um, now <laughs> as a time where we um, are gathering input, gathering information, checking in with our students to make sure that we can um, position ourselves better as we come back online and in brick and mortar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tammy to talk really specifically about some of the SEL resources that are available to you to use now in your virtual platforms. Tammy? Thank you. Um, first, I, I would really like to reiterate the, if you, I know there have been a plethora of resources that have uh, inundated teachers and schools and principals. And uh, if you could, in the Q&A, um, identify your needs. And I saw a few of them and I appreciate that. And we'll, we'll sift through those um, as we, as after this, after this session and, and begin to answer those questions, we'll, we'll have to identify a way of um, disseminating that information. But um, so if you have a need that you're seeing that uh, in your community right now or in your school, that has not been addressed or um, that you think OSPI or 
having some other resource might be more useful, um, or maybe it's just identifying specific resources, please identify that in the Q&A. That would be really, really great. Um, great. Thank you, Justin. Um, so in uh, with Washington, the SEL resources, uh, again, I'm at OSPI and um, one of the really fantastic things about SEL in Washington is the support, the legislative support. Over the last, since 2015, there have been bills that, um, that have mandated work groups who have created these Washington SEL resources. And uh, I'm going to, I'll just go over a couple of these and then I'll take you right to our webpage so that you may see those. Um, but in, on our um, webpage, the SEL, and you can get there either by following this link when you get that or just Googling OSPI SEL and it'll take you right there. Um, there are the adopted SEL standards, benchmarks, and indicators. The SEL standards and benchmarks were adopted as of January 1st um, this year. And then there is um, an SEL implementation guide. And this is an amazing resource that has a plethora of tools, best practices, and guidance on how to implement um, SEL with fidelity. There are a series of one to three page briefs that are specific, and I'll show you those in a second, that are specific to particular audiences or particular topics. And within those briefs, they have uh, additional resources you can go to. Then there are the SEL modules, and I'll be um, t delving into a little bit uh, more of that specifically in one, one set of the modules. And then uh, there are also trauma-informed resources on, on that website, as well as SEL activities for families and educators. So that, thank you, Susan, or Justin. Um, the SEL online training modules, those are, you'll see there's six different segments. Um, you do not have to go through those in uh, sequential order, however we do recommend that. Um, on the other hand, right now we're looking at, um, we're looking at the need that is occurring right now. And so I am going to delve into a little more of the um, trauma-informed SEL, the segment five. Um, in just a second, actually, I will take you there now. I'll share my screen. Yes. And so I'm going to take you. Oh, maybe it won't let me. Justin, will it let me share my screen on this? Yeah, I think I'm seeing it right now. Okay. So it says That's zoom on the, in the okay. middle. Here we go. So we want to go here. And so this is, can you see the social emotional learning webpage OSPI? Yeah, yeah okay. looks great. So this, thank you, Justin. Uh, this is the website. Uh, when you Google it, in, Google SEL OSPI, this is what it will take you to. It's the very first thing that pops up. And so you have the definition of social emotional learning. Then um, we have some activities, SEL activities for families and educators. And those were um, in this time, I, I was asked to put together uh, resources that, that were um, very descriptive or, or very quick, easy 15 minute, 15 to 30 minute activities um, for different age levels. And I'll delve into those in just a second. And then if you scroll down, we have all of these SEL implementation resources. And there's the, the benchmark, the standards, benchmarks, and indicators, the, the modules, and the implementation guide. And then scrolling down here, if it will, there we go. We have the briefs and 
So you'll see they are geared towards specific audiences or specific topics. And then in addition, we have currently the latest bill, um, Senate Bill 5082 has mandated that an SEL advisory committee be formed and they are currently meeting and there's the information about those. But um, the first thing I'm gonna take you to is the um, SEL modules. And so if you were to click on the SEL modules or the link that I provided, it brings you to the modules right here and identifies those different sections. So there are six, six different sections. With what is happening and the stressors that are occurring and the loss of jobs, as, as uh, Dr. Sagai and Dr. Barrett have mentioned, there are all kinds of things happening that are causing um, stress and trauma and grief and uh, loss and so understanding uh, the reason why SEL is so important is to to help students and ourselves to understand our emotions because you, there can be no healing without awareness and and then in addition as you go through and meet with these these students it's imperative that you understand that they may be going through trauma they may be experiencing uh, these stressors that will put them in fight or flight mode. And uh, the, this particular module, the trauma-informed social emotional learning um, has multi, a multitude of sections. It talks about the impacts. It talks about um, the long-term physical effects on mental health. It gives strategies um, for helping support the, to create the resilience within students. And then it also, um, talks about the link between SEL and trauma-informed systems. And then down here, um, and I'm just gonna click on that one, it talks about, um, it talks about, let me see, I'm having an issue with my mouse, the um, coping with compassion fatigue, which when, when we are inundated with the news every day and the real possibility of um, this pandemic and, and the, the deaths that are, it is creating and the sickness and the job loss. Um, and then you're hearing this also from the students. And, and I go back to Dr. Sagai's um, review of the study around school safety and 95% of the students feeling that they are, they, their school environment is safe for them. And then further talking about that and asking why they felt that way and understanding that it is because they have a connection with an adult or their friends. Um, and understanding we are connected, we are human beings and right now this isolation is causing mental health issues and, and trauma and stress. And so um, these, the, the teachers that are reaching out, the principals, and then the daily barrage of, of news is impacting you and can cause that compassion fatigue. So there are, there's all kinds of information. There's an assessment, there's a tool um, kit for you uh, to look at that because we need to be healthy in order to serve our students the best that we can. And, and taking um, an understanding wellness for ourselves, um, for the staff, um, for teachers and for students is imperative and, and how, to, how to deal with that. So there are strategies here on how to cope with that, uh, compassion fatigue, what it is, um, and steps to, to go through with that. So um, there's self-care assessments. Anyway, it's a plethora of tools. So I highly encourage you if uh, th these modules are all free, you just go in and create an account and then you can uh, log right in. You'll have to register for each module. Um, and and it, it is just fantastic. And a shout out to Ron Hertzell, my, um, Hertel, my uh, predecessor, who was responsible for creating this, this trauma-informed module particularly. Uh, 
And then the other section that I would like to take you to, uh, because I feel like with, we have, we have uh, parents at home that are now trying to teach their students uh, or their kids. And so what I was asked to do was put together some simple activities. And um, I'm just gonna go, go right into that PDF so that you, you see you can just access this right from our, right from our website. And what I've done is put together some links of different, um, uh, different ways, the di different sites that um, will help with mindfulness and being aware. Because again, um, when you feel these stressors, when you, when students feel these stressors, when parents feel these stressors, it begins to put you in that fight or flight mode, uh, which, which blocks off that frontal cortex, which is the decision, decision making and put you in that what if, what if mode? What if I lose my job? What if uh, I get sick? What if my mom gets sick? What if my child gets sick? Um, so all of those, that spinning that goes on. So being aware that that spinning can be calmed down by being in the present and looking at mindfulness. And so there are a plethora of sites here. Um, there's several pages uh, that will talk about mindfulness and really being aware of your feelings because you have to be aware um, in order to start working on these strategies. So you'll see that there's the link. Here's a brief description of what's on this site or the specific activity. And then the age groups that it may apply to. And then whether it's geared toward a family, which would sometimes the parent would walk the student through um, and or educators. Um, and then, um, so those were the, and I, and I thought that that is something useful that you could share with your parents. Um, I know <laughs> during their stressful time. Uh, and then as you start looking at um, returning back to the, the classroom, really looking at these other um, resources, specifically the implementation guide, and, and understanding that SEL should not be an add-on. It isn't, it isn't an add-on. It is the foundation of how to build these resilience, these skills and resiliency. Um, so that is what I have for you. I don't know how to go back and let me stop sharing. And um, I don't know if you want to close that up. Susan or not? Yeah, I can. I can certainly um, let's see. I wanted there are a couple more resources that I wanted to share before we um, take some questions. I know that there are a lot of questions popping up. Um, if we don't respond now, we can certainly respond um, in writing and post it on the website. I do see a couple questions with respect to the PowerPoint itself. Everything that we've shared with you is, is available for you to take and own and, and, and use. Um, I did want to highlight um, one resource or actually two resources for now. Um, one is a, a short brief that we did in 2018 around teaching social emotional competencies within the PDIS framework. And so you can see we use and rely on um, really explicit ways we do this through, um, through expanding the utilization of our school-wide teaching matrix. And so really moving beyond um, kind of the behavioral, um, like hands and feet to self, we wanna make sure that we're incorporating social emotional skills that we want to elevate and highlight. So we've got things around check your feelings. Um, we also added and incorporated an online piece in the teaching matrix to reflect kind of the virtual space. Um, but this, um, this is a resource that you can, um, you can use and share. It, it will be available on, on the OSPI website and the other uh, resource I wanted to share, I'm not finding at the moment, um, is an activity packet that was shared with me 
by our university HR department, which I thought was fantastic. And it was just fun things that you can do with your family, like play games and have scavenger hunts and go to virtual museums. And I just wanted to share that because I think at this moment in time, as we're all stressed, it's really important that um, we pick and choose our battles and, um, and you know, being together and just playing games and being present is it will go a long way. And so I just wanted to share that because it was, I felt like it was really a, a valuable thing for our family and I wanted to pass that along to your family. Um, so with that, um, Justin, I'm not sure if you were able to, um, to kind of look at some of the questions and I think we've got about five minutes to answer some of the I'm looking at a couple right now and I'll just answer those very quick because they're just, uh, so there's an error 500 um, from Ross Baker. You're, you're talking about the modules having the error. The modules were never meant to handle the absolute influx of, of audience that are currently on them. So when you see the error 500, it's shutting down the system. It's overloading it. If you wait, 10 to 20 seconds and then um, uh, re refresh, then it should pull that back up. Um, we are moving those modules to a second server. And if you go to the module on the website, it will prompt you to go to that ser server. So it should reduce that 500 error. Also, I saw one up here that was talking about um, the clock hours, the clock hours, that you're receiving for this webinar are not related to the to the modules. You do not have to go through the modules to get those clock hours, if that's what that that question meant. So uh, those were a couple that I just saw off the bat. Uh, there's another about are there activities or resources that you have or are aware of that are in Spanish? I. I do know there are some, and I will I will look into that. And Justin, we'll be able to get these all of these questions. Yeah, we'll send you a list of all the questions, and then what we'll do is um, once we get responses, we'll post those um, back to where the resources are on the web page, so people will be able to find all the resources and the the Q and A. Um, all on that page, and that's the MTSS page for uh, OSPI. Right. Uh, so the question was, can they get clock hours for completing the modules? We do not have that ability right now. Um, it is being, it has been run up the chain. Right now, it is not a possibility. Okay, thank you. Justin, mm -hmm. so, I see a question here from Christy Hoskins. Um, she asked, how do we help colleagues that feel pressured by the need for academic success also understand the vital need of SEL and support at this time? I really wanted to call that one out because I think a lot of us are gonna feel um, this really stress of the academic instructional minutes that have been lost with COVID. Um, but I can't emphasize enough, it is crystal clear um, in the research and, and how how our brains function and how we function that we won't be able to recover those academic losses without redesigning our approach, which includes SEL to be a core content area. The social emotional competencies we, we need to have will be absolutely critical. And I think what PDIS and MTSS really helps us set the stage with is creating a calm environment, a host environment where adults and students aren't stressed where we're not in chaotic settings. Um, it's when we're in those calming areas and when we can model calming behavior as staff that we will meet that high quality instruction that needs to be met. And so um, I, I recognize that we're all gonna feel pressure to make up that time, but this is a moment where we can really redesign our learning environments to be much more focused on wellness first and foremost and really anchor this moment into the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we were talking about earlier on in the presentation. I appreciate that, thank you. Were there any others, I know we're about at time here, um, that you wanted to try to address right away, otherwise I will um, share on my screen, try to share on my screen.
There we go. Um, additional questions, if, if you have them, you can email them to sisl at k12.wa.us and we'll put those into the list to be answered. And again, this is um, Tammy Bolin and Susan Barrett as the presenters and the session on addressing our social emotional learning needs for the adults and behaviors using the PBIS framework. Uh, the session recordings, we'll close caption those and we'll get those up onto the website by May 4th. And if you registered, make sure that um, the clock hour link was used if you are looking for clock hours for today. Um, that, thank you both so much. So much great information, great resources to share. Um, a lot to think about as we are thinking over this next year to two years to three years of <clears throat> what does this mean to, to support our students, to support our staff, to support our families um, in response to the current crisis that we have. So um, I really appreciate both of you taking the time to, to put this together and to share with us today. So thank you. Thank you. And we will uh, wrap up today's webinar. So thank you everyone. Have a great day. Stay well. Thank you.